Okay, so one of the things you might hear people saying is that um, our problem is, is uh, too small in, in terms of how much data we have. We can't use deep learning because we only have you know, 20 classes and we have 100 examples per class. And you need millions and millions of examples to do deep learning, so let's not, not even go near it. And that's just simply wrong. You can, you can totally use deep learning and, and models from deep learning, even when you only have a small number of training examples. <coughs> and the way you can do that is you can either um, learn useful representations using unlabeled data. So this is what's called unsupervised learning or unsupervised pre-training. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you do that in a later lecture. Um, you can transfer um, things that you've learned from other um, tasks to a related task. Um, and that's called transfer learning. That's what I'm going to talk about this time. And you can also do something like learning on a surrogate objective. So some, something that's similar to what you want to learn, but it's easy to get labels for, or it's easy to get ground truth for, not quite what you want to learn, and then transfer the knowledge from that. And I think Ava mentioned that something about that earlier on when, when she was talking about these surrogate classes and this data augmentation. You're kind of training on these things that you, you don't really care whether you can separate, you know, uh, rotated deers from or non-rotated deers or join them together but it's similar enough to what you do care about that you can learn a great deal from that amount of data and then transfer that to a task that you do care about um, so the idea with transfer learning is instead of training a deep network from scratch for your task you take a network that's trained from uh, on a different domain or sometimes on the same domain by domain I mean the, the types of images that, that it can see um, and then you, you take that and you, you uh, use it for a different target task so, um, as an example, you might have something trained on ImageNet and you might want to reuse it on something like Pascal Voc. I'll, I'll say what that means now in a minute. Um, and there's some variations on this um, idea. So, you could have the same domain and a different task. So, in other words, you've got, you, you care about images of, of flowers or trees or something like that. So, that's the same domain, but the, the task is different. One, you may be trying to classify different genesis of uh, species of, of flowers and then the other one you might be care about trying to uh, classify I don't know something about different types of trees or something so the domain is pretty similar right the, the, the types of images it sees are similar the task is different um, or on the other hand you could have a different domain and the same task so um, it's kind of a little bit harder to explain wh what I mean by that when you, well, how would you have the same task in a different domain but at the end of the lecture you, you'll see what I mean when I, when I say that um, Okay, so here's the sort of setup. Um, this one on the, on the left here is bigger because this is what we have big data from. So we have some source data here. So for example, something like ImageNet um, and source la labels, and we have lots and lots of these. We can do, we can train a model on this, um, and we want to use. Um, we want to. We, we're, we're really interested in this task, um, but we don't have as much data for this task. So this is a small amount of data and labels. But if you notice here, the models models are the same size. So we'd like to use a really powerful model for this. But this big model has lots of parameters, and we can't fit it for this this part alone. So we want to transfer some knowledge across, right? So transfer things that you've learned on this model to this to this task, right? So that's that's the idea. Um, so as an example, um, there's a data set on a task called Pascal Voc. Um, 2007 is is one of the years they ran it, and it's a standard benchmark. There's about 20 classes, about 10,000 images, and they're split about 50-50 into train and test. Um, and as we know from the last lecture, deep networks like AlexNet have many parameters, about 60 million parameters in, on AlexNet and many more in VGG. Um, so direct training from scratch using only these 5,000 images, 20 classes, uh, tra direct training something like a AlexNet, you're not going to get very far because you'll probably start to overfit. You just don't have enough images for that number of parameters to, to fit them. So what can we do? How can we train deep networks in this setting? This, this here is just some examples from Pascal Vox, so they're like some of the categories. Um, so one thing you can do is what, what's called um, off-the-shelf learning. So um, the idea is that you, you have your, this is your big network that's been trained on, on uh, ImageNet, and uh, you know, it has some convolutional layers, it has some fully connected layers. This is a kind of a cartoon, it's not exactly what it would look like. But and you have some loss and you train, you've trained that and, and it's converged and you do very well on ImageNet, right? So the idea is, okay, what, what can we do? Well, we cut, cut off the top layer of the network, right? All the stuff at the softmax and the FC2, that's maybe, if there's a thousand classes, that's a thousand dimensional. They're all specific to that particular set of classes that you were looking at for AlexNet, right? And you've got a different set of classes, a different task you want to do. So you cut, you cut that off, you simply just remove that. And you, you keep all the parameters on this layer below. So all of these guys say the same. You transfer that, and then you use this as a feature extractor, right? So you take your new 
target data. You pass it through these here, and you get some numbers out of here. These are features, right? And these features are now, because they've been trained from this network to be invariant to things you don't care about and sensitive to things that are useful for classifying images, you expect they may, they may work quite well for your, your application. And then you just stick a shallow classifier on the top. So you, you train an SVM on them features, right? And you keep all of this fixed, and this is called off-the-shelf learning, right? And this, this actually goes really well in practice, surprisingly well in practice. So there was a paper in uh, CVPR workshops in 2014 and um, that, that showed for, for a whole variety of tasks, uh, this was on par with or surpassed the state of the art in loads of different benchmarks. So uh, for example, in Pascal Vock and Oxford Flowers, which is a flower classification task, a uh, bird classification task, an indoor scene classification task, um, retrieval and, and Paris buildings. So this is a data set of different buildings from Paris photographs of them. The Inria Holidays data set, these are all sort of more retrieval benchmarks. And it, it actually beats the state of the art. And that, very simple, just take features from AlexNet, train a classifier on top of them. Uh, this is the Oxford 102 flowers data set. And these guys up the top here are like all um, previous state of the art methods. So you know, uh, trying to classify using bag of words, um, trying to classify using more complex methods like dense histogram gradients and coding and pooling and all various different types of things put together. And uh, you're just trying to off the shelf um, classifier on this, so SVM on, on these features. And um, immediately you're competitive. And then if you use data augmentation as well, so you do what Ava said earlier on is and you take the different crops and you combine the features that are coming out of that test time, you beat the state of the art. So really easy. Um, it's a good thing you should almost always try as your first baseline. So that's what they were suggesting here. It's an astounding baseline. Um, so come, but the question is, I guess, can we, can we do any, any better than these off-the-shelf features? Um, is there any way we can change the network in some way to better suit what we, what we want to do? And this is called uh, domain adaptation. And, and yes, in general, you can do this. Um, so the idea is for this is to train a network on a nearby task for which is easy to get labels, as I said before. So image net classification is one of them. Um, pseudo classes, as Ava mentioned earlier on, is another one. Uh, there's, there's loads of ways of doing this. There's new things coming out about slow feature learning and learning from ego motion. And there's various ways to get a network initialized into a good place. Um, and then, again, what we do is we cut off the top layer, like we did before, and replace it with the supervised objective. But instead of just using them off the, off the shelf features, we now fine tune. So we use back propagation through the whole network. So we, we replace the data with the data we care about and the labels we care about and the loss function that we care about and the classes, for example, that we care about. And we keep all of these initialized with the weights that they were initialized before. But now we back propagate all the way through the network. So um, we're, we're actually not just making updates to this area here, we're making updates all the way back down. Um, so doing this, you can generally often do a little bit better than you could with off-the-shelf features. Um, so it kind of, but sometimes you might do better with off-the-shelf features if you don't have very much data. So that the question becomes, um, which layers should you just keep frozen and not actually backpropagate through? And which layers should you update with your backpropagation? Um, so uh, yeah, the, the terminology is frozen. We, don't, we just keep the weights as they are. Um, and fine-tuned, we update them. Um, so generally, if if you have uh, hardly any labels, you want to freeze most of the layers. You just don't have enough data to update them. And the more labels that you have, then the more you can allow these layers to free up and possibly get refined. Um, as a sort of a generalization of this idea, you don't necessarily need to just go, OK, this is frozen, and this is being fine-tuned. You can say, OK, well, the learning rate on these ones is somewhat greater than 0, and this ones are 0, right? That's the same as saying this, this is frozen, right? The learning rate is set to zero for these layers, so it can't learn anything. But of course, you can you can set these as having a high learning rate and set these as having a low learning rate. And what you're really saying there is that I think that the features down here don't really need to be modified that much. They're already pretty general and they work pretty well. And these ones do need to be modified a lot. So for example, what you'll do when you're, when you're taking these uh, networks to fine tune them is you'll initialize your new top layer with completely random weights, right? So that one needs to learn a lot right up front, right? So this is going to have the high learning rate up here. And these ones are already in a kind of good enough position, so you might have the learning rates lower on them. Um, so I guess one of the questions that's interesting to ask is how, how transferable are the features that are learned? We've seen that already that people are getting great results with just off-the-shelf features, and it seems to be that whatever they're learning seems to be 
general enough for many tasks and you could ask yourself how how general are these features and at different layers you know how, how specific or how general are they um, and what we find is that at lower layers we have more general features as you might expect the things that are kind of sensitive to edges and textures and these things tend to be useful for a whole variety of things and then as you get further down the network it gets more task specific so you get more closer to you know the, the labels that you were originally trained on um, so these guys here have a paper on, on uh, how transferable are features at NIPS 2014. Um, so uh, this figure is not really, uh, I've actually put this on another slide because I want to just spend a minute to, to talk about it because I think it's kind of interesting. So what, what, they, have, what they have here is a, a base slot. So they, they took ImageNet and they divided it into two parts, right? 500 classes in one part and 500 classes in the other part. And they made, t took care to make sure that the two, the two halves of the data set were essentially different types of things. And they used the word net hierarchy to do, to do that. Um, and then this is just, if you train on half of the data, on, on, so you have A and B, um, and you train on B for half of it, and then you train the rest of it on B, right? And just, just as, a, as a benchmark, you get, you get values around here. And then what they did is they looked at, okay, well, what if we train on A, and then we fine tune, or well, f train on A, and then off the shelf on B, right? So that's the red dust that we have here, right? So if we train on A, and then off, and then sort of set all the rest of the weights randomly and then we fine tune them random weights for different layers we see that if we just do that cut cut at the say the third layer here we still get the same performance so all of this stuff here is really generalizable we didn't change them at all right we just learned them on half the data set and they work just as well on the other half but if you start to move along here then we see performance is going down right and it's because we're getting more specific to the A set here and we're trying to retune on, on the B set and these features don't work that well. But if you look at these sort of pink ones here, this is where they allow it to, the whole thing to be fine-tuned. So they train on A, they cut at about uh, layer three and then they fine-tune, they initialize these randomly and then they fine-tune all the way. And what you see is that the fine-tuning recovers it. So like even though these features were really specific, once you run the fine-tuning, they become less specific and then they transfer back over to the other data set. So in general, fine-tuning, if you've got, well, they, they have half of ImageNet, so they have loads of examples, right? But if you have loads of examples, fine-tune, it will make things better. Um, and the blue one is just when you take B and, and test on B. This is sort of to do with a, a sanity check for them. But the idea is that um, performance drops due to the speech features being too specific in the late, later layers if you do if you kind of use them as off the shelf uh, but fine tuning kind of recovers from this um, okay so the last thing I mentioned at the start there was this idea of same task but a different domain so this is kind of more understandable through this image here right so these this is the same task you're doing MNIST digits you want to classify things between 0 and 9 right but I there's a domain shift here we've replaced the background of the image with some you know, something random, like some, some sort of picture or something like that. And what we'd like to do is be able to train on this and somehow predict on this, right? And what, what, what I'm going to talk about here is unsupervised domain annotation. So you don't actually have labels for this data set at all, right? You've got labels for this data set, and now you want to apply the classifier you learned on this data set to this data set, right? And if you do that directly, the performance is not going to be great, right? Because these new colors and things like that, they uh, confuse it. But what you can do is you can use the distribution of features to somehow update your uh, classifier to work well on this data set. So here we have a, a, like a feature extract. So we have a, imagine this, is, this top part here is a, is a network, right? It's trained to classify these digits here, right? So we do a forward pass through this network, we get a class label, we backward propagate here, and we update all our weights, right? And then we have a, t a different domain. These are these guys here, right? And at the same time, we go through this thing here, and this is like a, a domain classifier. This, this part of the network is trying to say, is it from this or is it from this, right? So it's saying, it's trying to classify, did the image come from, from domain two or domain one? And the idea is that if you can produce features for which it's very, very difficult for this classifier to say whether it came from domain one or domain two, is that the distribution of these features is identical for both domain one and domain two, then it should work well on both domains, right? It should transfer well. So th this paper here described a way of doing this. So the idea is that you, you, when you have something from different domains, you go into the domain classifier, and if it gets it, if it, gets it right, if it can figure out the difference, then you, you back propagate through this, you reverse the gradient because you want to make this network less uh, or produce features that are more or make it more difficult for this part of the thing 
to, to be able to classify between them. And then when you have labels for it, when you have this, these guys here, then you just go and produce the class label. And you do that together at the same time, so sometimes on these images, sometimes on these images, and you end up producing features that are more generalizable. You'll see later on when, I think it's on Thursday, I'm going to talk about adversarial networks, it's a very, very similar idea to that when, you, when we use adversaries. Um, so this is the kind of results that you get. Um, so for, for honest, if you train on the source, if you just train on these and you test on uh, these guys, you'll get about 57% accuracy, right? And if you just train on these guys, you'll do very well, you'll get 98% accuracy. But if you didn't have labels for these, right, and you, you wanted to train on these and use the domain annotation technique, you'll see that you go from 0.57 to 0.81. So that's a, that's a like, pretty significant um, improvement. And you, remember, you, you, you're assuming you have no labels for these, this task, so that, that works quite well. Um, so in summary, it's possible to train very large mo models on small data by using transfer learning. Off the ship, shell features work surprisingly well in, in many domains and tasks. Lower layers of the network contain quite generic features, whereas higher layers contain more task-specific features. Um, supervised domain ad adaptation via fine-tuning always, always improves that performance if you've got sufficient labels. Um, and it's possible to do unsupervised domain adaptation as well. So you, you can do this thing that I just talked about there to match feature distributions. Uh, that's everything. So any questions?